So here are the vascular territories that we've talked about so far, and a really nice drawing here that illustrates here in red the middle cerebral artery, which remember is mainly the lateral hemisphere, the posterior cerebral artery, which gets the undersurface of the temporal lobe and the occipital lobe, and then we have the anterior cerebral artery, which um, supplies here uh, the superior frontal gyrus um, and also most of the medial surface of the brain. Okay, here we can see the posterior cerebral artery supplying the occipital lobe and temporal lobe. And on the medial surface, the middle cerebral artery does supply a little bit of the temporal lobe there. Now let's talk about venous drainage of the brain. The veins empty into these venous uh, sinuses, which are located between the two layers of the dura, which we haven't talked about yet, but we'll be able to see those in lab. So first, I'm just going to go through here a labeled drawing of this. And so there's a reflection of the dura we haven't talked about right here, but it is this whole area right here. It's called the falx cerebri. And this is a very uh, tough dural reflection that goes in between the interhemispheric fissure or in the interhemispheric fissure, very important for stabilizing the brain. And so there's a venous sinus located in the upper portion of the falx cerebri, and this is called the superior sagittal sinus. There's a venous sinus located in the inferior reflection of the dura here, called the uh, inferior sagittal sinus. So if we just kind of follow the drainage here, a venous drainage of the brain, it goes from the superior sagittal sinus down to an area here called the uh, confluence of sinuses. Okay, and this joins together with the straight sinus. And if we follow the straight sinus back, we can see that it gets a contribution from the inferior sagittal sinus here and the great vein of Galen or just the vein of Galen here. So these two come together and form the straight sinus and they join together with the superior sagittal sinus in this area here, the confluence of sinuses. Okay, and on this sagittal drawing, this is hard to appreciate, but the, from here, the transverse sinuses, this one is coming out toward you, the other one is going away. So these are really moving out laterally. Okay, so from the transverse sinus then we have, this empties into the sigmoid sinus here, and then down into the internal jugular vein and out. So the only other things to add in here is that we have drainage from the cavernous sinus, which is not shown here, but the eye and the orbital contents are drained from the cavernous sinus, and that empties into the superior petrosal sinus, and if you could just label this, I forgot to label this one, the inferior petrosal sinus. Okay, so the petrosal sinus is here, empty like this, the superior joins with the transverse sinus into the sigmoid sinus, the inferior petrosal sinus joins with the sigmoid sinus, and they both empty out through the internal jugular vein. Now, if we just look at this cross-section here, now we're not going to see the um, superior sagittal sinus or the inferior sagittal sinus because that's all been cut off. We've done like a section like this, okay? But here would be the confluence of sinuses. This is where the superior, superior sagittal sinus joins in with the straight sinus. Here we can see where the inferior sagittal sinus and the great vein of Galen here would join in with the straight sinus. Here we can appreciate how the transverse sinuses wrap out like this. Okay, so the transverse sinus here joins with the superior petrosal sinus. And here we can see now the cavernous sinus. And you can kind of appreciate the cavernous sinus lies right behind the eye. So eye drainage is into the cavernous sinus and then into the superior petrosal sinus and the inferior petrosal sinus. Okay, so the superior petrosal sinus joins with the transverse sinus into the sigmoid. The inferior petrosal sinus joins with the sigmoid sinus into the great jugular vein, which is in this uh, location here. Okay, so practice going through an unlabeled um, section here. So again, here is the falx cerebri, this reflection of the dura into the interhemispheric fissure. Here's the superior sagittal sinus, the inferior sagittal sinus, 
the great vein of Galen, the straight sinus. So again, straight sinus and superior sagittal sinus joined together here at the confluence of sinuses. And then the transverse sinus, here we can see on either side, the sigmoid sinus, the internal jugular vein, and then the superior and inferior petrosal sinuses here, superior and inferior. Okay, and again, confluence of sinuses, straight sinus, here's where the inferior sagittal sinus dumps into the straight sinus, the great vein of Galen, the transverse sinus, sigmoid sinus, jugular vein, and here we have the cavernous sinus, superior petrosal, and inferior petrosal sinuses. It's very important that venous drainage is efficient because if we have a clot or something that includes flow, um, then pressure backs up quickly and the brain does not tolerate incre increasing pressure at all well. So we can do a study here called a venogram. There are different ways of doing this and so this nicely outlines the superior sagittal sinus. Here we can see the straight sinus, confluence of sinuses, and here we can see there is a problem. The transverse sinus over here is draining nicely into the sigmoid sinus. And so here we have a problem with lack of flow here in this transverse sinus. Um, and so if we have a venous occlusion like that, we get increased intracranial pressure. And we'll make a big deal later on in the course. What are the symptoms of increased intracranial pressure? That will occur later. But what can happen is if the arterial flow if that can't efficiently drain into the venous system, pressure backs up and we get a combination of ischemic infarcts. So that means there isn't enough arterial pressure to oxygenate certain areas of the brain. So we get an ischemic infarct. And because of the high pressure, we can get bleeding uh, infarctions as well. That's called a hemorrhagic infarct. And the one that is most common is the superior sagittal sinus. Um, so we'll talk about that. The other one that is relatively common is occlusion of the cavernous sinus. So remember the cavernous sinus drains the eye and the orbital contents. And if, so if the, we can't drain that adequately, we develop, the patient develops what's known as a painful ophthalmoplegia. Ophthalmoplegia is just a big word that means the eye doesn't move well. And because of all the pressure around the eye, it's painful. So we see a lot of swelling or orbital congestion and proptosis, that means that the eye is literally getting pushed forward out of the eye socket. So here's a patient, and I don't appreciate, I don't expect you to understand what's going on here, but we have a problem in the cavernous sinus, all right? And so pressure is backing up, so we get this uh, orbital congestion, redness, proptosis. If we were to have this patient turn to the side, you would see that this eye is pushing out further compared to the normal eye. And so our neuroimaging is very good at picking up, and the radiologist can tell us exactly what's going on in the cavernous sinus. I mentioned that a superior sagittal sinus thrombosis is more common. And so back here, this is the front of the brain, the back of the brain. Here's the superior sagittal sinus, and it should look like this all the way across. So you can see here we have a thrombosis, and so we don't have adequate flow drainage here in the superior sagittal sinus. And so what has happened here is um, this lower part of the brain, this all looks normal. And so this darker area is not getting enough blood flow. This is an area of ischemia, okay? And since the superior sagittal sinus is midline, uh, the ischemia tends to be kind of in this midline location. What's in a midline location that we've talked about? Well, the paracentral lobule. Remember motor cortex for the leg, sensory cortex for the leg, the bladder. So we'd expect to have some dysfunction uh, in those areas. And here we can see some complex findings, uh, which I don't expect you to understand, but just notice their midline. So we see areas of ischemia and hemorrhage along the midline when we have the superior sagittal sinus thrombosis. Um, when does that occur? We'll talk more about this later in our stroke lecture. But we see this a lot more often in younger women. One of the more common scenarios is immediately after delivery. 
when there is a hypercoagulable state, um, and also there may be some dehydration, and that's a time uh, when, uh, unfortunately, women are prone to uh, develop this. And um, I've seen a number of cases of this. It is treatable, but uh, again, we'll get to that later. Now, just a little bit on vasculature of the spinal cord. Along the course of the spinal cord, we have a single anterior spinal artery and two posterior spinal arteries. Okay, at the upper portion, upper cervical, this is supplied by the vertebral arteries, but that's not enough to provide adequate oxygenation for the entire uh, spinal cord. So uh, the spinal cord vasculature is boosted all the way along by these radicular arteries. And I don't really care that you know um, where these radicular arteries come from. Some come from the vertebral, thyrocervical trunk, um, from the aorta. Um, now remember, I used the term radiculopathy last time to say a lesion of the nerve roots. And so these radicular arteries... There's a radicular artery with each nerve root, so that means there are 31 radicular arteries, and these do supply the nerve roots uh, with uh, oxygenation. But in terms of the spinal cord, it turns out that there are only about seven or eight radicular arteries that contribute meaningfully to uh, spinal cord vasculature. And so here we can see uh, the anterior spinal artery, okay? And notice up here it gets supplied by the vertebral artery and then there are a variety of branches here off the aorta we can see. Um, so this just kind of highlights there are only like about seven or eight of these radicular arteries that are really important in terms of contributing here to the anterior spinal artery. Okay, here are the posterior spinal arteries, which um, in the upper portion, actually these can be supplied by the um, pica. Okay, so... Here we can see the anterior spinal artery supplying most of the anterior portion of the spinal cord, and the posterior spinal order, arteries supply the posterior uh, or dorsal aspect of the spinal cord. Now, um, there's a little bit of debate over this, but there is one particularly large radicular artery worthwhile knowing by name. It's called the artery of Adam Kavitz. And um, again, this is an especially large radicular artery which supplies mainly the lower thoracic and upper lumbar spinal cord. And again, this is a large radicular artery, and the result is there's a little bit of a watershed area or an area above the artery of Adam Kavitz where there's relatively less vascular supply. Okay, so that's the upper thoracic area, T1 to T4. And so um, here we can see, um, again, these are nerve roots. And so these are radicular arteries, and so this is showing you the artery of Adam Kavitz, which contributes to the anterior spinal artery here. All right, so let's say that this is mid-lower thoracic cord. So right above this, uh, and this is especially relevant, like if someone is having surgery on their aorta, and maybe the blood pressure goes low during surgery, and the area then above the artery of Adam Kavitz um, is at relative danger of not getting enough oxygenation. And we'll talk about later what um, ischemia of the upper thoracic cord can look like clinically. All right, and just one more picture here showing you the spinal cord, the anterior spinal artery, the nerve roots with radicular arteries, okay? And again, you can see some of these, most of these are small, but then we have, you know, a really large one here, the artery of Adam Kavitz, a major boost here to the spinal cord vasculature.